connecting. All right, so we're starting on the special senses for today. Our goal is to cover part one, and then we're gonna skip down and do part three. Of the five special senses, we're doing olfaction, which is smell, gustation, which is taste, vision, obviously that's seeing, and then the other thing we're doing today is hearing and equilibrium. So that's our balance as well as our hearing because they're both located in the inner ear. So as far as olfaction and gustation, so taste and smell, we'll start with smell. As you guys, I brought my little skeleton man here. Okay, here's my little skeleton skull. And inside, oh, it's, so I'm removing the top of the head. And then right above the forehead, if we look straight down, try to get as close to here as possible, but we'll see it when we do also the bones. But there are, there's like a ridge. I don't know if you can kind of see it. I always like to think this here is like a little shark fin right here sticking up. So that's a feature we're going to learn later. But what's most important is on, it's not really plastic, on either side you would have an olfactory bulb lay here and one lay there. We have like an olfactory bulb at the bottom of the brain laying on this part here. And that part is these two channels, one on either side. So they are really right at the top of the nasal cavity. First smell, we have olfactory nerves that literally dangle down through that skull portion into the nasal cavity. It dangles down, you can see these nerves going through the bony structure and it's actually now where air would be in the nasal cavity. This is in this expanded view over here. Above that would be this olfactory bulb and the olfactory bulb lays within the brain. Let me go here. So this here is the olfactory bulb where the blue are the nerves dangling down. When it brings the information back to the brain, I'll just put this arrow back to the brain, that is the olfactory tract would be down here. Inside the nasal cavity, you can see the little dots. Those represent smell, you know, baked bread or whatever you're smelling. And so you have molecules, but they do not touch directly these little nerve endings. They actually have to be dissolved in mucus. Mucus in our nose has a couple of jobs. One job that we'll talk about here is where we have the odor molecules will bind into this mucus layer and they literally dissolve and it's the dissolved that will actually stimulate the nerve endings that tell our nose and then our brain, hey, we're smelling something. If you have a cold, you make a lot more mucus. And so what happens is those odor molecules are still dissolving in the mucus, but now the mucus layer is so thick that it takes it too far. It can't diffuse to bind to your smell receptors. So that's why you can't smell very much when you have a cold because it's too much mucus. The neural pathway, and this is the important thing that it does not go through the thalamus. Now the thalamus usually directs all of our senses. This one is a very base and primal sense. It does not need the thalamus, so that is an important point. So the neural pathway are first the little nerves coming up from the nasal cavity, then to the bulb that lays there on the two channels I showed you in the skull, although you probably couldn't see it very well, the track that comes back, and then it goes to the hypothalamus, which is here, and then to the temporal lobe, which in this view obviously is about this region, but just out the screen from you. And it goes to the limbic system. If you guys remember the limbic system, that's the one that has the smell, memory, and emotions. Like smelling a love letter with perfume makes you think happy thoughts and makes you remember good times. Or, you know, smelling cookies makes you happy and think of grandma those kind of things. So here's the neural pathway, goes in to the hypothalamus and then to the temporal lobe, which you can't see in this subtle view. So that's it for smell. You need to know it is dissolved. You need to know the nerves, bulb, track, and you need to know the neural pathway. For taste, you should know that the papilla are the bumps on our tongue. People always stick their tongue out. Well, they don't always stick their tongue out, but if they were to stick their tongue out, 
and actually see the bumps on the tongue, then you would say, oh, those are my taste buds, but you would be wrong. Those are papilla. Lingual just means tongue. The gustatory cells, these would be your taste, known as taste buds, because they're individual cells. And where these guys are located, these little taste buds, are actually down in the cracks between the lingual papillae. Here are the actual taste buds because they're the individual cells. And we have different tastes. You used to be able to say, oh, we've got bitter, you know, back here and sweet in different parts. But the mapping doesn't, isn't always consistent from person to person as it once was thought. But those are your basic sensations, but that the, this list has actually expanded quite a bit. So the neural pathway, we have several of our cranial nerves that is involved in taste. It then directs it to the medulla because that's where those cranial nerves are coming off of. Then up to the thalamus because almost all the senses go through the thalamus except for smell. And then up to that primary somatosensory cortex. And remember that's like a body map. So it actually goes to the part that goes, matches the tongue as far as what, how the body map would go. It's taste it also has to be dissolved. We're gonna say that whatever you are tasting has to be dissolved in saliva. Just like whatever you're smelling has to be dissolved in mucus. So if you had like a Jolly Ranch or a hard candy and you just had it laid there on your tongue, uh, and then you wouldn't taste it. You'd have to let the saliva start to melt and dissolve part of that. And then it's falling down the cracks between your papilla and that's how you're able to taste it. And so the uh, same with smell, it has to dissolve in the mucus for your olfactory nerves to be able to detect it. So we're going to, how do we hear and how do we keep our balance? So as far as our ear goes, we have the outer ear, which is known as the oracle or pinna. And the shape of it is purposeful in that it's actually helping to direct sound waves into the ear. External acoustic canal, I have it highlighted, outer, middle, and inner ear. So you have your outer ear, which is gonna be the oracle or the pinna. That's not on this list, it was on the last list. Then you go in and our tympanic membrane is the same thing as our eardrum. So tympanic membrane is just the word that you're needing to use on your test instead of eardrum, and that's located right here. And it literally is a drum. It is a very thin layer of skin that's pulled taut across this opening. It vibrates when sound waves come into it. Sound waves are physical waves. So what's happening with that tympanic membrane is in your ear, as sound waves come in your ear, it's literally vibrating and moving. And then ossicles are these three little guys. The ossicles are our, th they're th three smallest bones in our body. Well, you have sound waves that come in through your ear because you hear, hear like screeching brakes or a crying child or a whisper. This tympanic membrane will actually vibrate. And when it vibrates, these things act as a gear when the tympanic membrane is located here, and then you have a bunch of ossicles kind of zigzagging from the other side, the tympanic membrane is going to move based on sound waves coming in from your ear. So it comes in, the tympanic membrane vibrates, and then it causes these ossicles, so it's sort of pushing them, and it causes them to pivot, and they literally amplify the motion of the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane is the eardrum it's gonna move slightly. What the ossicles, it almost acts like a hydraulic system that they will move and they literally are going to punch into as like a plunger. And so whatever vibrations happen here are also happening in here, but larger, it's amplified. So we can actually increase the vibrations coming into our ear. So then we have a round window and an oval window. We'll get to those specifically on the inner ear. When we talk about the inner ear, we have the cochlea, which is the snail shell. So that's here, that's going to be for hearing. And then we have the semi or the vestibule is going to, and the semicircular canals, both of these are going to be for balance. 
the vestibule is going to be this little area here, and then the semicircular canals are these circles right here. So together, these guys here are responsible for our balance and our equilibrium. And then finally, our eustachian tube, and there's a few other names for it, is down in this area in green. And that part is going back to our nasopharynx. It's actually the space behind our nose, above our mouth. And the whole purpose for the eustachian tube is that when you have pressure, say you're going diving, I don't know, so let's say, I guess if you are going up in an airplane, higher up in an airplane, you would have decreasing pressure out here, right? Because you're going up higher in atmosphere, like up in an airplane, if it's not pressurized. Well, this tympanic membrane, because the pressure is dropping on this side, it actually might bow out. And when it moves, it's very, very painful. So the whole reason why when you're going up in an airplane, they want people you to swallow, or if you have a baby, if you have a nursing baby, they actually want you, or a baby on a bottle, they want you to actually be feeding the baby at the time that you're going up in the airplane because swallowing, because sometimes this eustachian tube can kind of get fleshy and collapse. So by swallowing, it allows air through the mouth to balance so you have air equal on either sides. And that way your tympanic membrane is not bowing out in one way or the other. It's also why if someone has a really bad cold, they're asked not to fly because even if they're not stuffy when they get into the airplane, they could get stuffy and their mucus could plug up the eustachian tube. And therefore when they go down and they're going to land, high pressure is gonna push here. And if you're not able to equilibrate through the eustachian tube, you can actually rupture your tympanic membrane. Um, and it's incredibly painful. So those are some of our basic features of our ear. This is a zoomed in view of the inner ear where we can see the cochlea, the snail shell, where we're gonna hear. We see the vestibule in here where we have what we're gonna learn later about the utricle and saccule. And then we have the semicircular canals. So essentially, just to give you the answer ahead before I even give you this part of the lecture, the canals are for your dynamic balance. Like say you're gonna be spinning and doing a pirouette or doing somersaults or cartwheels. That's gonna be your semicircular canals. That's known as dynamic equilibrium. This utricle and saccule part, that's more for your static equilibrium. Like if you're leaning over to one side or you're looking down, um, say down a canyon, your body leaning, it's giving feedback, say to your cerebellum, that's actually gonna give feedback to your muscles to keep you in balance so you can stay upright. It's a different kind of balance in that area. As far as our middle ear goes, we have the tympanic cavity. That's just because it's behind the tympanic membrane. It balances the air pressure with the eustachian tube. Now I put this sort of auditory with a red line through it because sometimes it's known as the auditory tube, which makes no sense to me because sound waves are coming in from the ear side, not up through the eustachian tube in the mouth. But sometimes it's known as the auditory tube and it can be confusing and I just prefer not to utilize that term. So eustachian tube is actually an old fashioned term, but it's one that's the more of a more common term utilized. This permits the equalization of pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane, and this is where those three ossicles are found. And like I said, these guys are the smallest bones in our body, and this is what they look like compared to a dime. So you can see the malleus, which is a hammer. There it is. It looks like sort of an old Viking club or something like that. The incus, is supposed to look like an anvil, like a horseshoer would use. And then the stapes is, looks like an English stirrup, a stirrup on an English saddle. So that's how they kind of got their names, the malleus, incus, and stapes. This is an actual picture of them, which is so cool. You can see the tympanic membrane there. So you're literally seeing the light, someone shining in someone's ear. This is the view up from the eustachian tube. So you're looking right into this middle, middle ear. It's really quite an amazing picture. And we see this um, stapes located right here. And we have the malleus and incus in a little bit further in. But you can see it's attached on one side 
into the tympanic membrane. And the other side, it's actually going to one of the windows leading into the cochlea. I want you to also notice in this cartoon drawing on this side, notice these muscles. There's a muscle drawn here, and then we can see sort of another little muscle here. And there's a few other muscles. They are also our tiniest muscles in our body. That is because if something is too loud, you're hearing like at a rock concert or you're just like standing by a kid screaming their head off, having a fit, and it is loud for your ears. Instead of allowing the incus, the malleus, incus, and stapes to hinge and magnify and amplify the sound, these muscles will actually hold those ossicles rigid and prevent them from moving and therefore dampen the sound. So if you have someone yelling in your ear, we have these inner ear muscles that'll actually hold these three muscle bones together and not allow them to, to uh, move. And how this works, so we talked about the um, tympanic membrane vibrating like the surface of a drum. What happens is as this vibrates, the energy gets transferred and where this stapes is, it's literally like a plunger on this membrane and it's pushing in and out because there is a channel on the other side that has fluid in it. So it's like it's pushing in and out like it's trying to make a wave in this fluid on the other side. That's really how we hear it. It's kind of funky. And we'll see that in the cochlea. We'll summarize the ossicles in the middle ear. The purpose of the ossicles, so you should know the three names. Here's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Their job is to amplify sound. And so that's in the middle ear. We have the eustachian tube, tube to equalize pressure. I think that's just written on the last slide um, across the, so we have pressure here and pressure here. And we wanna make sure it's balanced across this tympanic membrane so it doesn't bow one way if it has high pressure or bow the other way because it indeed can rupture. Little kids that get a lot of ear infections, they will get a tubes in their ear and literally a tube is just going right through here so that it allows for pressure to go across because kids with chronic ear infections will have a lot of obstruction or inflammation in their eustachian tube. And so they get earaches and, and it allows for drainage of pus out plus equilibration of pressure. So on to the inner ear. We have the vestibule, which is going to be in here. We have our semicircular canals that are going to be up there. We have a really, really cool skull in the lab. The skull is cut and set right through this. And you can, it literally looks like a termite has been in the skull going in a circular tunnel in the bone of the skull itself. And the cochlea is the hearing area. We'll do our balance and equilibrium first. The vestibule is going to be this part within here, and we have the saccule and utricle. I said that this is more static, but it's also gravity, so again, leaning over one way or the other, and linear acceleration. So what this utricle and saccule does is if you're in a car and like you accelerate and you're like, whoa, and you lean back in the car, or if you slam on the brakes and you lean forward, that's your linear acceleration, your forward and back. Or it's just the, I'm leaning over this way, or I'm leaning over this way. It's actually where you really get seasick too, because you're sort of bobbing up and down on a boat. As far as the semicircular canals go, those are these big loopy things. Now, the semicircular canals, I usually, when I'm doing this part in the lecture in the classroom, I have a hula hoop. Now, just to save you, I don't do the hula hoop because that would really, I'm really bad at that. But I usually hold the hula hoop up and say, hey, our semicircular canals are this way. So I hold it up so it would be like, hey, lined up if I'm going to do somersaults. And then another semicircular canal, then I hold it like this so it's around like if I were to do a cartwheel. And this plane. And then I twist the hula hoop down so it would be like you'd really use it like a hula hoop. And that would be like if I'm spinning and because I'm old, I would, I'm picturing Dorothy Hamill in my mind as far as a, um, <laughs> a figure skater, but whatever the newer ones are. But anyways, the semicircular canals are aligned 
in very precise directions so that it gives you feedback on which direction you're spinning. And the cool thing about the semicircular canals is that they're filled with fluid. It's why 50 somersaults on the mats. Like I'm just gonna do a somersault and a somersault and somersault and you get up, you're gonna be still a little dizzy from doing that motion. And that's because just like if you're stirring your coffee and the fluid is going around and you pull the spoon out, the fluid is still continuing to spin. So even when you do your 50 somersaults, the fluid in the semicircular canal that's actually going the direction that you would be obviously somersaulting in, um, the forward direction, that fluid is continuing to spin. So even though you are done with the somersault, your brain is still getting an information that says, hey, we're still spinning because the fluid is still going, activating those receptors. And that's why people get dizzy because the information their brain gets from the eye is I'm perfectly still versus being different than the information from the fluid that's continuing to go. So people get nauseous from whether it's roller coaster rides, when every time there's a miscommunication or misinformation, your eyes are telling your brain, I'm still, but your semicircular canals say, no, I think we're still spinning. Um, the same thing if you're going to do a pirouette and just stand and go like, you know, see kids with their little arms out and they're turning and they're spinning around like mad and then they like are wobbling all over. That's because those canals are still spinning, but their eyes, um, they're not sure how to adjust their muscles to fix that. So the semicircular canals, the important part here is the fluid, whoop, why is that? the fluid is actually stimulating these little receptors here that's at the base of each of the three. At the base where each of these semicircular canals are located is their receptor. So that's what's getting stimulated when you spin. In the vestibule, this is our linear acceleration ones, so that's over here, our saccule and utricle, that's sort of in this here. So we've got our saccule and utricle, and literally, don't worry about the names of these guys here, but if you are in the car, you know, you, the car accelerates going forward and all of a sudden you feel it like, whoa, you lean back in the seat of the car versus the brakes being applied, then it, you know, the hair cells move that direction, sort of the way your body would move. But notice how it's pulling or pushing on the ground where these hairs are attached to. That's the signal that's going to your brain of which way you're leaning or being moved. We also can see within here, these are some of the receptors, but it's within this gel layer. And these otoliths are almost like weights in the gel. So it allows it to move this way or that way, causing these little hair cells to either like bend forward or backward, but you have this sort of gel that they're within that kind of pulls it this way or pulls it that way. So it's, that's why there's all these like weird little components. So off we go here and then in the vestibule. So what you should know from here is the vestibule. So that would be where that's located. So that's gonna be in this main, let me change my color. I'm always seem to be picking the bad color. So this is the vestibule, so it's not the canals. And the, in the vestibule, we have saccules and utricles. Those are the terms you should be able to associate with the vestibule. And that's where you wanna associate with gravity or acceleration or deceleration. Like in the car, zooming forward or backward, sort of just these very linear movements. So that's the main thing. These other slides are just sort of giving you more, more information how it really is happening. That when you're gonna zoom forward, the car is zooming forward, all of a sudden these hairs are gonna be like winged back because this went back this way. So these things just help pull it forward and back so that the, so that's vestibule, saccule, utricle, linear acceleration, or just static equilibrium. The ampulla, in the semicircular canals, that's these little guys at the base of each of those three. They work similar in the fluid. We already talked about the fluid winging around these here, causing this ampulla. And I think of it, I don't know, I'm kind of goofy. I think of this as an ampulla because I think it looks like the letter A. So that helps me think of little tiny letter A's that kind of poke up into these semicircular canals. 
So that helps me remember it's the ampulla in there. And literally, so this is sort of, I overexpanded this slide, so that's really pixelated, but you can see this little ampulla in this canal, this tube. So let me just sort of draw the tube like this. And if you are spinning around, the fluid is going to go, you know, around and it's going to push this little ampulla over. So it kind of goes this way as you're spinning. And as it, when it's shifted over, that's what's going to fire the nerve to go tell your brain that you're spinning in that particular direction. Whichever circle, you're, whichever direction you're going is whichever circle is going to get activated. So it's not, so hopefully not too bad. So as far as the ear goes, you should know oracle pinna. You have the external auditory tube. That's sort of the where you put the Q-tip or something. That's your outside tube. Where it terminates is going to be your tympanic membrane. Behind the tympanic membrane is the middle ear. The tympanic membrane moves. We have the ossicles. The ossicles will amplify that movement and it will cause a plunger effect into the cochlea, which we're gonna do next. As far as the balance goes in our inner ear, we have two parts in the inner ear, the vestibule, the vestibule is the space, but the little receptors inside are the utricle and saccule. Those ones lean based on whether we're driving forward or back in a car or leaning over. Then we have the ampulla, I always think of as an A, in the semicircular canals and that will go whatever direction. So the cochlea is actually the snail shell, come on, snail shell part. So this is where we're going to hear. Back to the stapes, we have the oval window here. The oval window is right under the pad of the stapes. This part here is our snail shell that we're doing a side view slice through and then like imagine that we're sort of trying to unroll it. Now the organ of Corti is the term that you should know from here because that is this orange layer. So the organ of Corti is, the re, the, is where the nerve endings are attached to. And think of all of these little nerve endings sticking up off of the organ of Corti like a piano. That one end, if one of these little hairs get bent over, then it would make, it would tell your brain that you're hearing a very low note. And if one of the um, is bent over and moves over, then you're hearing a very high pitch. It's kind of like a piano, but instead of pushing down, it's got all these little hairs. And if one end has a hair that gets moved, then it makes that low sound versus at the other opposite end, if it gets moved, it's going to be a high sound. How we hear is really the sound waves where you have a low sound, you would have the frequency of the sound wave is different than if you have a really high sound. And so it is literally the frequency of the sound waves determines where along that organ of Corti, the little hair cells get bent. And if you listen to sounds too loud, that you're actually bending them over, you can cause complete damage to them. One example that I have is, and it's about pitch too, when I um, lived up in Idaho for a few years, I was living on a ranch. And of course, in Idaho, you're ranching in Idaho, you know, the winters, you're not really out a lot outside of dumping hay off for your cows. And so most ranchers are half mechanics, you know, you're just working on your baler and whatnot through the winter. So we had this friend, this rancher family, it was a really sweet family. And um, the husband, the mom, the wife used to get really, really mad at the husband, the dad, because she would like, he never listens to me. And her son, he'd talk to him and the dad would respond to him. So he'd be like, hey, dad, dinner's ready. And he'd be like, oh, sure. But if the wife or the mom would come in and she's like, honey, dinner's ready, he would just blow her off and she would get so mad. But truly what his problem was, was being in the garage all winter long and wrenches are falling down and that falling and the pinging of wrenches on the floor of the garage is kind of a high pitched sound. And it's right by his head. 
So he actually annihilated the hair cells on the organ of core T in the high pitched range. And his wife has this really high squeaky Minnie Mouse voice. So whenever she would talk, he can never hear what she's saying because he's, and so she's mad because she thinks he's ignoring her because he answers to the son who has a deep voice. So anyways, it, you can cause damage to these hair cells and it will cause permanent damage because once you do damage, they don't come back. If you go to a rock concert and you're getting glaring, really loud noise coming into your hair, ear and then you leave the concert and you've got that ringing in your ear, the ringing in your ear is telling you, you just fried some of your hair cells. And in fact, the ones you there's some that broke completely and you're not hearing anything the ringing in your ear is the ones that are like imagine like a tornado coming through an area knocking down houses and then some houses are like halfway up and halfway down those are the hair cells that didn't quite get knocked down so they're sort of like halfway bent so they're literally stuck in the on position and that's why you have this ringing in your ears because it's sort of telling your brain you're still hearing this sound when you're not because it's sort of bent over and stuck in this on position. The important part here is from the oval window, oh, let me circle this, the in malleus incus and stapes is pushing in and out, it literally goes in and out based on the tympanic membrane moving. So it moves in and out like a plunger. And as it's pushing in, it's creating sound waves. And if it's a really low sound wave, versus it being a higher sound wave. And so you can see an area that might get stimulated based on high pitch versus low pitch. The frequency of a sound wave, that means, is it like this, this would be low, or is it, this would be a high pitch, and this would be a low pitch. So that's what frequency means, how many cycles is going, versus amplitude. So we can have one like this, or we can have another one that would be the same frequency, but all of a sudden it's, oops, I can go down here. That would be louder, and this one would be quieter because that's the amplitude. So how tall it is tells you how loud it is versus how many waves there are, that tells you the pitch. So here we have, this one would be a low sound, low note, and this would be a high note because there's so many more. Um, this one is the same note for both of these. This one is just gonna be quiet, it, quiet, and this one's gonna be loud because it is about how tall it is. Okay. So the pathway of sound waves, it comes in from your external auditory canal, it hits that tympanic membrane, causes it to vibrate, those ossicles move and they actually magnify and amplify the sound and it pushes in on the oval window that Stapes does like a plunger which then causes these waves of the fluid inside the cochlea that causes those hair cells to bend over based on whatever pitch it is. So it's on the far end or either way for the, whichever note you're going for. And then ultimately on the other side, because you have preservation of energy, you go in through the oval window, but after it goes across the cochlea, you come out, but these sound waves actually escape out the round window. So here is our little plunger with our oval window. The sound waves will go in and it's gonna come out the round window. We'll go here. So we have our middle ear. We have another, so you can see the sound waves coming in, hitting the tympanic membrane, going through the middle ear, through the oval window, hitting these various hair cells, causing them to bend at different points on there, which tells your brain the different sounds. This is an actual photograph of an inner ear showing you these actual hair cells as they gather up to nerves. Do you guys remember what cranial nerve number eight was? It was vestibulocochlear. And vestibulo actually means it's coming from the equilibrium side and the cochlear is coming from here. So all of these kind of gather up and they're ultimately gonna go back to the brain via that cranial nerve. This is the organ of Corti. These guys in like a V formation are actually the hair cells. So they're just in this weird pattern. And then you can see the nerves down here at the bottom that's coming 
from. So if these little hair cells got bent over, then this nerve would get activated. Or if these hair cells got bent over, then this nerve cell would get activated. And that's how your brain, your primary auditory cortex tells, can tell which pitch you're actually hearing. This picture, this is actually from a guinea pig. This here is normal. And these are the little hair cells. This is after a sound that's equal to, say, a rock concert. So you can see it just looks like tornado damage in here. You see some are still, you know, up. But you can see some of these. Look at this guy. This is just kind of half bent over. It's half demolished. This one would cause this particular um, guinea pig to have ringing of the ears, where you have some areas here where it's entirely gone. So they've lost the sense of hearing, at least for that level. What, how, what are the different types of deafness? Well, we can first do conduction deafness. That means the sound doesn't really get into the ear. It's just muffled. So one of the causes, it could be lots of them. I just sort of put this one here, otospongiosis. It's actually bone deposits down out here with the ossicles. So it actually makes it harder to bring sound waves into that oval window. So that's known as conduction deafness. And that one is really your nerves are just fine, your hair, hair cells are fine, the organ of corti is fine, your inner ear is great, you're just not getting the sound waves to it. Now nerve deafness, that is an inner ear problem. You're a, not able to convert or activate any of those hair cell nerves, and so your brain never gets the impulse. So that way it just, you might be, you know, everything else is working on the way there, but it's just not getting into your brain. If you have progressive nerve degeneration, not always, tinnitus can be due to other things too, but one of the um, symptoms of that would be tinnitus, which means ringing of the ears, because you're actually degenerating this nerve, which is causing this aberrant impulses going to your brain. So even though you're not, that sound isn't physically out coming through your outer ear, your brain is interpreting it because these cells are getting activated. So before we leave, I'm going to give you a little culture. And actually, if I click on this, it's supposed to go to the Ninth Symphony, but it doesn't work anymore. So Beethoven, my favorite composer, he was uh, well known for being a giant grump. Um, part of his grumpiness, he had sort of a, a bad temperament, but he was amazing and very creative. But one of the things, if anyone's ever had a chance to listen to the Ninth Symphony, which is one of the most beautiful symphonies out there, and actually of his symphonies, I'm kind of a, I love Beethoven for some reason, from the sixth, seventh and eighth um, and to the ninth, they're his best ones, but he's actually going deaf while he wrote them. And um, the ninth symphony is, most, is you know, considered like you know, a masterpiece and he was completely deaf when he made it. He had the most amazing hearing and here's this sort of quote I have that he has about it where he says, you know, he was very upset because he said he was very prideful and so he'd have to tell people speak louder shout for I am deaf he's like I can't say that I can't admit to my poor hearing because he says this is how could I have referred to a weakening of a sense which ought to be more perfectly developed in me than any other person he could listen to an entire orchestra and tell if one of the 15 violins was out of tune or you know he could discern so much so he really had this amazing sense so it was quite frustrating for him as it was going away so he is um, an example of they are suggest well there's been lots of speculation of how of what his problem was whether it was due to syphilis and whether it was a conduction deafness or not but it was the progressive nature suggested it was more of a nerve issue but again there's a lot of debate on that but anyway so i wanted to people have different levels of hearing attunement and that really has to do with your auditory association area and he really had it quite well developed on the other hand, Thomas Edison, and so I only put these here because Beethoven was an angry man and, you know, although amazing, Edison loved his deafness, in fact. And so he was, you know, obviously did a million amazing things, but he actually refused an operation, oops, that would allow him to hear because he considers his deafness as an advantage because he could concentrate. And so they, um, speculated for him that he had some sort of conduction deafness because 
of his ear infections. He was whacked across the ears. I think they reported that he had his ears boxed, sort of as a way to punish kids when they were younger, um, and they would just do that. But that great pressure on both sides would cause the tympanic membrane to rupture, and so it could have been scarred, and so that would be evidence of a conduction. So both of them are likely conduction, but at the same time, I wanted to end this with someone feeling very positive about this infirmary versus someone being extremely angry and negative about it. Nonetheless, you should feel comfortable knowing about the um, equilibrium, the static, the dynamic, and then how we hear, it's basically those hair cells get bent over, they're anchored on the organ of core T, the sound waves go in the oval window, come out the round window, the ossicles, the stapes that's putting, pushing in that oval like a plunger um, is because it's from the tympanic membrane pushing and the whole point of the configuration of the ossicles is to amplify that movement. And that's how we hear.